there. This is the plaque, and I'm going to have Karen give it to you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for these flowers. They're beautiful. Um, first, let me give my biggest thanks to the Freedom From Religion Foundation, of course, and to everybody here. And a special thanks to the Eisenbergs, um, who really help support students like Max and myself. Um, like Lori, Annie Laurie said, I was honored with the um, Thomas Jefferson Student Activist Award last year. And I was dizzy with happiness, quite literally. Um, and today I feel exactly the same way uh, to be receiving this award. Um, and I can give you my thanks all day, but I will never be able to fully express how wonderful and supportive the Freedom From Religion Foundation has been to me. Um, the story I'm going to tell you was certainly no walk in the park for me, um, but it was made possible by the people who came to fight at my side, and that was Annie Laurie and Dan and all of you, and you are some of the coolest, bravest people I have ever met, and uh, thank you for everything you do. One year ago, I spoke at the Freedom From Religion Foundation annual conference in Hartford, and I had to end that presentation by saying, now we're waiting for the judge's decision. And that was disappointing, so this is part two. Um, and I know you're probably all tired of hearing about me. I am. Like, I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm done hearing my own voice. Um, but today, I can tell you that the decision was made, and we won. And everything has changed for me in the last few years, and I really like to reflect on what's happened, because it's a lot. Um, I was born and raised in Rhode Island, and I spent my entire life there, and I started attending Cranston High School West as a freshman. Um, I was 14 years old, and the town I grew up in, Cranston, is overwhelmingly Catholic. Um, in fact, Rhode Island is the most Catholic state in the country, which most people don't realize. Um, I don't think most people think about Rhode Island, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, growing up there, I was always, I always knew that I wasn't exactly welcome to share my real beliefs. And I continued to call myself a Catholic, which I was born and raised, I was baptized, um, until the day that I came out to the entire world as an atheist. Um, it started at the end of my freshman year um, in spring of 2010. And I saw the prayer banner for the first time in the school's auditorium. And like I said, I was only 14 years old. And although I was not out of the closet, I had been an atheist since I was about 10 years old. And as a side note, lots of people don't believe that I was able to think for myself at age 10. And for a while, I started thinking that maybe my memory's off. Maybe I was older. And I started doubting it. But then my seven-year-old brother came up to me and said, if God is real, then why doesn't he show us? And I was like, you know, there's no way I was too young at 10 to be having those thoughts. <laughs> um, but anyway, I had seen this banner, um, which wasn't actually a banner at all. People call it that. The media, I think, started that. But it was actually a six by eight mural that was painted on the wall of the school's auditorium. And I knew almost immediately that it was wrong to be in a public school. I was young, but I wasn't dumb. And I had a better understanding of most adults do of the US history. Um, but like most people, I didn't know what I could do about this. I thought of going to the principal's office and just reminding him that it was there, because he must have forgotten. If it's there, then he just doesn't know about it, right? Um, and so at 14, I had no idea. I was naive. So I contemplated what could be done, and I did a lot of research on the Constitution and American history. And by the time I finally decided that I wanted to report this to the administration, school had already gotten out for the year, and I thought I would have to wait until school started up again in the fall. Coincidentally, and this is a coincidence, which most haters don't believe, um, I'm a puppet. Did you know that? Um, 
But that summer, a private group rented out the auditorium for a recital, and the mother of one of the girls in the recital noticed the prayer. And as a secular Jew, this prayer was unsettling for her. Um, also in the audience that night was her mother-in-law, who was a um, Jewish Holocaust survivor. And they don't tell you this in school, but Hitler was a Catholic. <laughs> she worried that when her daughters were old enough to be attending the high school, um, they would be going to that school, um, they would be reminded every time they were in the auditorium that the Catholic faith, faith was preferred in our area, that they would feel out of place and that they would feel less valued by their school and by their community. So she went home and she decided to write to the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. And the ACLU sent a letter to the school simply saying that they have become aware that there is a prayer displayed in the auditorium and that it needed to be removed because it violated the First Amendment rights of the students. That summer, the school committee put together a subcommittee to discuss what their options were. Of course, there really weren't options. In this country, we vote on many things, but we don't vote on people's rights. Or we do, but we shouldn't. Um, and that's no matter how insignificant they might seem. This prayer seemed insignificant to a lot of people, but that doesn't give you the right to violate my rights. Um, but they informed this subcommittee, they, they formed the subcommittee and started holding public meetings um, and members of the community could come and share their opinions and thoughts and concerns. And when I read that this issue had been brought up, I was so happy and relieved. I thought, well, awesome. Now, I don't have to do anything, right? Um, no, no. Um, but I was really invested, and I wanted to reach out to that mother and show her that, I was, that she wasn't the only person who felt the way she did about the prayer. And I wanted to her support, just like you guys did for me. Um, now keep in mind that I didn't know the atheist community existed at the time. I was young, and I had just turned 15, and I didn't know. I didn't know what the ACLU was until that year. And I certainly didn't know that this whole community existed. So since realized I was an atheist, I had believed that I was the only one out there, with the exception of a few family members I had and a couple of friends. So I did the only thing I thought of, which was I went on Facebook. And that works really well. <laughs> um, I created a group specifically about removing the prayer. And uh, guess what? I was literally the only person in the group. <laughs> that Facebook group is a really, um, it's very reflective of how I felt through all this. <laughs> Um, I had that group for months, um, and when school had started up, I would come home every day to check and see if anyone had joined, and no one did for months. But I was excited. I really wanted someone to join my group. Um, so in November of 2010, as a 15-year-old sophomore, I attended the second public meeting that the school committee was holding. Um, when I got home from school that day, I just like skimmed through my homework as fast as I could, and went online to find those foolproof arguments that proved prayer in school was illegal. I wrote down some quotes and facts that I'm sure you're all familiar with on a little index card and went off to this meeting. I had to get a ride from my dad. Okay, I was really young. Um, I still am. I just... <laughs> and I was naive. I believe that when I got to the meeting, these educated and elected administrator, administrators and lawyers um, and politicians were going to say, Oh, we forgot it was there, we'll take it down, because of course that's illegal. That's not exactly what happened, though. Um, I got to that meeting, and there were only about 15 people in the room, um, but I was so nervous that I didn't even want to take my coat off. It was like a security blanket or something. Um, all my life, I have absolutely hated public speaking, just so you know. Um, and I've always been shy, and I've always been afraid to share my thoughts and opinions with other people. But at this meeting, I was so confused and upset by what people were claiming about our country's history and constitution that I decided that I had to speak. And I was literally shaking, and my voice was so soft, it's amazing that people were even able to hear me. Um, and I said, as an atheist student, this prayer discriminates against me. And don't get me wrong, I knew that atheism was unpopular and taboo, but I had no idea how much so. And I had no idea in my community. 
As soon as the words were out of my mouth, someone let out an audible gasp, and another person whispered, that little witch, under her breath. <laughs> I was shocked, intimidated, scared, um, but I was also really angry. Not only did I find it incredibly distasteful and rude to be gasping and calling young students names, but the people that followed me to speak were lying through their teeth. It was like someone was reading all the worst YouTube comments. <laughs> this is a Christian nation, our founding fathers wanted it to be that way, or um, there's only one atheist, so why should we do what the minority wants? Or just, you know, simple, dumb things that you hear all the time. And I had said that prayer didn't follow the prayer in the school was not obeying by the concept of separation of church and state. And in this case, prayer was the church and school was the state. I thought that was pretty simple. Um, but this priest who had come to the meeting smirked at me and said, honey, Russia had state schools. We certainly don't want that. It made me so angry that I decided to speak again that night, even though I was so scared. Um, and like I said, I was intimidated, but I had to do this because he's wrong. And so I did, I spoke again, and um, people were, you know, verbally pounding the table and trying to take away our rights. And so the next time I spoke, I noticed how good it felt to say, I don't believe in God, and to just let them squirm, and to not care. <laughs> I had been pretending all my life, my short life, and standing in front of people who hated me for it, and I didn't have to care anymore, and it felt really good. And it didn't matter what they thought, because I was there to talk about my rights, and I have every right to proudly share my opinions with the world, and I'm not going to stop. So that night, a video camera was stuck in my face, and I was on the local news, just for being an atheist. It's really that easy. <laughs> uh, I was so shaken up, though. I had honestly thought that the meeting was just a formality, and that no one would actually be saying that it should stay up, because, you know, they're educated adults and stuff. But I learned that, easily the, the biggest lesson I learned in all of this was that there's a difference between an adult and a grown-up. An adult is someone who can vote, someone who has aged into it. A grown-up is something that you have to earn. If you're a grown-up, you've earned that. You're grown-ups. And up until that night, I thought that stuff like this only happened in the South. Sorry, Max. And, <laughs> and um, I went online that night, and I found that my Facebook group had exploded. In a few hours, over 150 people had joined. That seemed like a lot of the time. Um, and were wishing me support. And eventually, the group reached over 6,000 members on that Facebook group alone. That's a big part of how I got through this. And I don't know if I... Well, maybe I could have gotten through it, but I don't know if I would still be sane if I hadn't had that. Um, and the average high schooler doesn't exactly watch the news and keep up to date on what's going on in their community. So a few people at school knew what was happening and no one really brought it up. But silly me, caring about our rights, I kept researching and speaking at those meetings to convince them to remove it. And that's kind of when everything started getting crazy. Um, the next meeting was February 2011. And that meeting was much larger. We had spent the time between November and February wishing everyone a very forceful and italicized Merry Christmas, and um, while also finding more outraged people to come to the meeting, and, you know, that damn pesky minority. And so there were maybe 100 people that night. And I don't think most of them knew why they were there, because a lot of them were talking about abortion and, like, <laughs> America's borders and random stuff. The economy, I don't know. <laughs> um, this older woman who was there 
said something about how the prayer in the school reminds kids to be good and not get pregnant. And then she pursed her lips and looked over at my friend and me and, like, really? <laughs> really, you don't know me. <laughs> the meetings went on and on, and in March of 2011, they held the last meeting where the full school committee voted on whether or not they were going to keep the prayer up. Um, and at that meeting, over 250 people were in attendance, and all but six were wearing signs that said, keep original banner. Um, have you noticed that? They really like signs. Like, they like to talk over their time, and so they usually get cut off, but they have to remind you of how they feel, even when they're not talking. So they wear signs, uh, of course. And um, understandably, these people were intimidated by, and the elected officials who were on the school committee um, were nervous. You know, they feared for their jobs. And uh, I'm not making excuses for them. I don't really like any of them. Um, <laughs> And so after six hours of this meeting, I remember getting out of school, which is a six hour school day, and going to this meeting and the meeting was longer. Um, they voted four to three to keep the prayer up. And you know, as you would assume, I was devastated. I had spent so much time and invested so much energy and commitment into this, and I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach, that I had you know, really just kind of been belittled the whole time and nobody took me seriously and politics was more important than doing the right thing. And so, it was easily the most frustrating day of my life. Um, but just because some people tried to vote on my rights does not mean that I was gonna settle for that. Um, they're politicians, that means they're popular. That does not necessarily mean that they're smart, and it certainly does not mean that they have the power to take our rights away. <laughs> but they try to, all the time, and I was faced with this issue and I decided that I needed to see it through and I needed to get the help of the ACLU and I filed a lawsuit, Alquist versus City of Cranston, in April 2011. And the morning after we filed, I came into school and I went to homeroom like I do every day. And the morning announcements came on and everyone rose to say the Pledge of Allegiance, but during the appropriate moment, all of the students turned and screamed under God at me and of course, and I was actually surprised by that. I'm surprised that I was surprised, but yeah. And I should have expected it. I really didn't know what to expect. And the teacher did nothing. And I knew that reporting it was useless because most of the administration hated me anyway. So I just sat back down. And from that morning on, I refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I haven't said it since. Um, I refuse to take part in something that is used as a weapon. This is not one nation under God. And personally, as a side, I think it's utterly sick that on the first day of kindergarten, we have five-year-olds memorize how to pledge their allegiance. They don't know what allegiance means. <laughs> and of course, as I'm sure you know, under God wasn't even added until the 1950s, which is coincidentally the same decade the prayer was first put in the school. Um, and so it's funny when they tried to say, well, it's okay to keep the prayer because we say under God in the Pledge of Allegiance and that's okay. No, that's not okay either, sorry. Um, and basically, the school was not friendly atmosphere for me anymore. Um, this was the kind of thing that happened every day. The students weren't the only people trying to make my life miserable though. Um, the administration and members of my community were inexcusably unconcerned about my daily treatment and often made things even worse. During diversity week, the school has little presentations about discrimination, um, bullying, racial topics, et cetera. And while in my sophomore year, the diversity week team decided to invite the mayor, Mayor Fung, to speak to the students about minorities and how as a Chinese American, he had succeeded in the world of politics. After he finished giving his nice little speech, um, someone asked, how do you feel about the prayer? We were in the auditorium and he pointed to it and he goes, I want to see that prayer stay exactly where it is. And he said, I have a law degree, and this doesn't discriminate against anyone, and uh, I'm Catholic. <laughs> and so all the students in the auditorium jumped up and started cheering and clapping. He's the mayor, he's not exciting. But he, they, were, they were glad, and of course he was pandering for votes. And uh, shortly after, an autistic student raised his hand 
and tried to explain why the prayer was illegal. And the mayor just kind of dismissed him. And none of the 10 or so teachers in the room offered to let me leave or do anything to calm anyone down. They just let this go on crazy and totally off topic. And I just had to sit there and let them all stare at me for the remainder of the presentation. And that wasn't the only thing either. One day while I was in English class, my friend and her boyfriend, well, my friend's boyfriend texted her, and yeah, we texted in school, and uh, to tell her that in his class they were debating prayer, and, you know, the prayer, and kids in the class were threatening to beat me up. And also my friend who had been at my side, and she's been at my side from the very beginning. I'm very lucky to have her. We've been best friends since seventh grade, and we're still best friends now. And I think her parents blame me for her being an atheist, but it's not my fault. <laughs> but anyway, this obviously scared us, and so we went to guidance, and we had to get dismissed early from school that day. And there were afternoons when I would come home crying. To be honest, I was pretty miserable that whole time. People who I'd once been acquainted with wanted nothing to do with me. I didn't even see my friends very much, because even though they still liked me as a person, they didn't want other people to hate them for associating with me. Even just walking down the hall to use my locker was a struggle because people would yell things and people would stop me in the hallway. But really, I didn't know what to expect. I still hadn't had it as bad as it was gonna get. Um, I thought I was, I was acting like it, I was really whiny. Um, and things got much, much worse. In January of 2012, I received a phone call from Stephen Brown, the executive director of the Rhode Island ACLU, and he simply said, hey Jess, uh, we won. And I was thrilled, I was so thrilled that I was like, shut up to this esteemed lawyer. <laughs> and more than excitement though, I was really relieved. I was relieved to have won the lawsuit, but I was also relieved that this was finally over. This nightmare of a high school experience was finally done and everyone could just forget about what happened and my life could go on as normal. But that's not what happened, again. The very night I won, the craziness started. People took to social media to express their sincerest hate for me. And the Twitter and Facebook absolutely exploded with death threats and rape threats um, and other terrible things. Um, I'm not even gonna get into that. Um, my favorite, and I mean that ironically, of course, um, was, OMG, she almost as bad as blacks. <laughs> Let that sink in. But yeah, kids who I had known since kindergarten were threatening my life and insulting my character fundamentally, saying that I was a bad person, that I was a freak, that I should die. People said I should be gang raped and my family should lose their home and live out of boxes on the streets. Um, some of the kids who I had classes with warned that they were going to throw things at me if I came to class. Um, other people threatened my family and claimed to know the license plate numbers of the cars my family members drived, drove. Wow, forget about that. Um, my home address was posted online, and I'm the oldest of four. I have an 11-year-old brother and a 7-year-old brother who I was worried about every single day. I have a little sister who's 15. She goes to that school and I had to worry about them the whole time I was in class because these people seemed to have no limits. And my daily life was very scary. Um, one day I got home from school and I was walking up my driveway and a group of kids drove by screaming out the window that they hate me and hope I burn in hell. They had followed me home. Um, the threats became so terrible, in fact, that the city decided to provide me with police officers who followed me around from class to class every single day for weeks. And I don't need to explain to you how that made learning and having a normal high school experience impossible. Um, the community as a whole was doing everything they could to make me feel hated and out of place. They wanted me to leave. They literally said, get the hell out of here. And there's this organization who tried to send me flowers, uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation or something like that? Uh, yeah, those guys. Um, they contacted four different local flower shops, and I know you just heard about this, um, and they all refused to send me flowers. But you know Annie, Lori, and Dan don't give up, and they were mad, and they eventually found a flower shop in Connecticut that agreed to send me flowers, you know, that evil little Satan girl. And the atheist community was so glad that someone had finally not been a bigoted jerk that they sent me so many flowers 
that I was not able to see my floor. And I'm amazed that I didn't suffocate in my sleep. And the owners are really nice people. I know you saw that video, and they were quoted saying something like, we're thankful for the business and praise, but this is our job. We don't really need to be praised for not discriminating against people. <laughs> and um, they, I actually know them personally now, and they're really good people. And I believe that they're atheists too. Um, <laughs> And of course, you all know about Evil Little Thing. I can't seem to get away from that. Um, I was actually introduced as an Evil Little Thing at the Reason Rally, um, <laughs> in front of 25,000 people. And they presented me there with a check for over $62,000. And that was a scholarship fund that Hemet Mehta had started, the Friendly Atheist. And that's so that I can go to college. And it's, here's to a better future, I suppose. And um, it was really meaningful to have the people who had donated in front of me, um, JT Everhard, had started making t-shirts that read Evil Little Thing, and, <laughs> of course, and um, he was selling them and the profit was going into my scholarship fund. So thank all of you who, who did that for me. That's one of the greatest things that's come of all this, obviously. Eventually, the subcommittee held the final meeting to discuss whether or not they were going to appeal the judge's ruling, the ruling that we had won. In the weeks leading up to that meeting, my wonderful Uncle Steve, who everyone thinks is my father, um, who also founded the Humanists of Rhode Island, which is a very um, big group. I mean, we don't have that many people, but it's a big group. Um, and he sent out email and Facebook alerts, and he did everything he could explaining that we really need people to come to this next meeting to show support for the court's ruling so that they don't make the idiotic decision of appealing, um, which they couldn't afford. The school's already in debt, and they spent over $150,000 on this lawsuit, paying my, my lawyers, because they had one. They all worked pro bono. <laughs> but of course, who got blamed for that? I did, of course. Um, and, you know, my uncle was successful, though. Um, people did. They came from out of the state. They drove for hours just to be there at that one meeting and stand in the rain so that we could all get into this meeting. Um, they had to, what was it? They sent police in to the um, building that we were having the meeting in early so that they could search the building for bombs. I'm not kidding. It's that ridiculous. And also, they tried to make it sound like the atheists were the ones who did it, of course. Um, but. Like I said, people came, and that meeting had hundreds of people, and it was just as hilarious as it was scary, really. Um, there was signs everywhere, screaming, people, lunatics, all you can imagine. Um, and after hours and hours of people speaking, po on a positive note, it was more people on our side than the other side this, at this time, um, and they decided not to appeal. And I believe that was a 5-2 vote. And so we won. And it's over now. And yeah, the hate continued for a little while after that. But overall, I came out of this far more positive than negative. The support I received was infinitely stronger than the hate. And again, thank you for all of that. Um, this is a great group of people, and I'm so glad I found this community because they've given me a lot more than I would have expected. Thank you.